Hello everyone and welcome back to Behind the Trowel. My name is Natasha Bilson aka Tash underscore Archeo and welcome back to YouTube live streaming with us. Today we have a special live stream with the archaeologists on and off screen of the Great British Dig series two. I know can you believe it this is the second series that we're doing a live stream on in one year. I cannot believe it. 2021 has been bizarre for all of us in so many ways. I am so happy to introduce you to our guests. I'm now going to change the screen a little bit so you can see everyone here. And there we go. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, yeah. So I think, first of all, let's do short introductions. Name what you do and your role in the show. So I'm going to go with what I can see on my screen. So Chris, you're next. Hi everyone, um, my name is Chris Scott. I'm a director at Solstice Heritage and we um, help to do all the sort of behind the scenes elements of the archaeology to do with the Great British Dig. And in my role, I'm the site director. So I um, am responsible for making sure that the archaeology on the site is done properly and that we do the archaeology in a way, a way that helps to make sure that we get a TV programme at the end of it, as well as a good archaeological excavation. You're on mute. Thank you, Louisa. <laughs> <laughs> um, Chloe, please. <laughs> oh, hello. Um, I'm Chloe Duckworth, and I'm basically the opposite of Chris, because. I do all the on-screen archaeology, <laughs> although I really did dig that um, trench on my own in a single day in Falkirk, I would like to point out. Um, but yes, hello, <laughs> that's me. And Marcus? Hi, I'm Marcus Abbott and um, I work in digital heritage and my role is to analyse digital content that we get, so um, maps and uh, LIDAR plots, contour plots, things like that, but also to do digital reconstruction of pottery, digital recording of trenches, and then to try and pull everything together and produce a reconstruction. And reconstructions, you're the man. We'll get to <laughs> questions later about what you produce for us. Hannah. Hello, my name's uh, Hannah Russ, and uh, I actually wasn't involved in Falkirk at all during the episode, so I've got my David Griffiths hat on today, here. <laughs> um, and then, uh, but after the episodes, uh, I'm involved in uh, looking after the things that we find and doing the analysis and making sure that the right people look at the things that we found. Mm -hmm. And your company is Archaeology Biz. Yes. Link is in the bio as well. The post excavation work. Yes. And Solstice Heritage, yeah. Chris as well. Everyone's links is in the bio, by the way, as well as their Twitter handles. And I'm sure if there's anything that we do talk about today, we'll put the links in the description or in the comments section for everyone. Dr. Louisa. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Louisa Campbell, and I'm a research fellow in archaeology, um, focusing on Roman archaeology at the University of Glasgow. And I was involved in the show really to kind of give a bit of background and context to the Romans in Scotland, um, specifically on the Antonine Wall um, and uh, its place in uh, the history of Scotland, really. So, yeah. And last but not least, Mr. Seeds and Grains Man, Don. Uh, hi, I'm Don O'Mara. I'm the environmental archaeologist on uh, some of the episodes. So my work is to and look at this sort of evidence for the, the local environment that might be present on the site. So the guys, when they're digging, will take uh, soil samples and then I filter out the remains of plants, mainly uh, seeds and grains, and then see what that can tell us about the local environment and what people might be eating. Thank you all so much for joining in because actually all together we have very varied experiences and when we come together it just kind of shows how teamwork is the dream makes the dream work yeah I don't even know the phrase I've actually forgotten teamwork it is dreamer. Team there you go yeah <laughs> and you really oh. get that and it's so nice that we get to see a bit of it on the show as well because there's a lot of jokes that is cracked throughout the series the episodes the days the very very long long days yeah. like 12 hour days sometimes 14 hour days you guys don't understand what we go through <laughs> <laughs> but I mean we're all there for one reason and that's archaeology now um where to start so the program is 47 minutes long 
according to all4.com, which is where you can catch up on any of the episodes. That's 47 minutes. How can you fit five days worth of archaeology digging into a 47 minute episode? So Solstice Heritage, Representative Chris, how was that process for you? Because I know your role mainly was actually the commercial, commercial archaeologist getting the dig done. And we did have Jim doing sort of the other side, liaising with the production. Yeah. Um, but how was that process for you? Because it's hard to get that balance. It is, yeah, yeah. So we have got to, uh, one of our rules is to identify sites that might be might work for the format of the show. So we're already thinking then about what site might deliver interesting archaeology for TV, which is important because one of the big elements or, or one of the things that's most that's really important to us is about actually this show engaging people with archaeology in a positive way. Um, so to have some archaeology that, that people can see is important, but also as well as that, we're trying to find sites where, where potentially the show could actually provide some real useful research output as well and really it's ideally a virtuous circle if we can do both and get some engaging archaeology that's good for the screen but also some really good research out of the show as well and Falkirk's a really good example of that so that's one side of it the other side is I suppose how much we dig on site like you said we're only really there for four or five days so that means we've got to do a lot of digging in quite a short period of time but also it can mean that some of the stuff we excavate maybe doesn't fit into the final show, unfortunately. That doesn't mean it's not important. And it, obviously all of the work that we do gets reported on. But sometimes, unfortunately, not everything that we find goes into the show. Lots of good stuff does. So that's for us, that's great and really gratifying to see that, that the archaeology that we excavate is presented and gets out there. Um, and then working through part of our role as well as working through the edits and actually making sure that what goes out, you know, has been looked at, not just by us, but for example, Hannah as well um, has, is helping with that process. So to make sure that the stuff you see on screen, you know, has really been thought about and provides a fair representation of some of the interpretations we make as well that's the thing I mean we're filming we're on site um have I still pinned myself I have um we're still on site we're doing what we can and we're interpreting as we go along and I know there is the post-excavation phase which is where you have you know Hannah David and co they're going to be looking at the finds and making sure I guess we've interpreted it correctly and there's always this sort of liaison isn't there with the commercial archaeology companies the Solstice Heritage and the production company so Strawberry Blonde it's a continuation. This is it's, it's going back and forth. It's like communication is key anyway. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a great example of how two different diverse industries can work together to create something that's engaging and fun. And then for us, gets more people into archaeology, which is what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> and in this particular episode, Chloe, there's something that you said, um, and I think it was in the opening remarks. And you said, unlike Hadrian's Wall, little is known about the Antonine Wall. Louisa, how did it make you feel for starts being a part of the program and being able to show us that thought? And then in general, having a program shine some light on Scottish archaeology. Yeah, it was great. I was very pleased to be invited to uh, join in the show. I think it was a really wonderful opportunity to, as you say, just to shine the spotlight on Scottish archaeology in general and Antonine Wall in particular, because um, it is very different to Hadrian's Wall, as you saw through the episodes, it is a turf built rampart rather than the stone built that we're all familiar with on Hadrian's Wall, so therefore parts of it don't survive as well as they do in Hadrian's Wall, so it's not so well known and there's lots of parts of it that maybe are, uh, you know, they don't survive uh, or have been built over, etc. So we have we do have stretches that are really, really well preserved, which is uh, actually where Hugh and I were filming next to Rough Castle, beautifully preserved part of the wall there. It's the best preserved sort of section up that way. So it was great to be able to do that and to really kind of get a chance to highlight all the wonderful archaeology we have here and explore some of the areas that haven't really been looked at before. So um, that was a really good opportunity to do that and to bring it out to a wider audience, I think. So not uh, the local community. And actually, I thought what was really interesting there as well was 
lots of the members of the local community didn't really know too much about the, um, the archaeology that was in their own local vicinity. So I thought that was really nice that you were able to bring them on board and, and to actually bring uh, the local people into and at the end of it to see what came out. Um, and they hadn't been aware of what was there. So I thought that was great. Uh, so yeah, a great opportunity to, to really explore and bring Scottish archaeology to a wider audience. It's such a shame we didn't get to meet you. So I know. <laughs> it would have been so cool to go on like a little field school together. Yeah. <laughs> Run up and down the ramparts. It would have been wicked. Oh, that, that's not, well, usually when we, when we bring children uh, or even students <laughs> to that section of the wall, we often do a bit of a role play. So we get them to charge us, you know, and we do a, a whole kind of episode of the, the Romans uh, against the the local um, the local indigenous warriors who are uh, charging us down, you know. Because of course that's what it is. It's these the ditch and all the rest of the bits that maybe we didn't get to see. As you see, everything squashed into, you know, there's a lot of information there that you can't fit into that 45 minutes. So there's a lot of defensive features there that we weren't able to look at. And so, you know, um, hopefully people will now go out and explore that and they'll see the different uh, parts of the Antonite Mall that are surviving in their area. So. Well, hopefully, I hope it does drive a bit more tourism there because mm. when you think of a Roman wall, you think of Hadrian's wall, don't you? That's like the wall and everyone goes to and they walk up and down it. You can get like a medal for doing the walk. I think we should do one for the Antonine wall. I mean, I don't know how fun it will be to walk along it. I've done Hadrian's wall and that was not fun. Um, so. <laughs> well, in, in, a, in a couple of years, we're going to be doing a pilgrimage along, Hadri uh, along Antonine wall as well. Uh, so that we're in the process of planning that out just now. So come back in a couple of years and I'll tell you how that goes. That'll be cool. I'll wear an outfit and everything. To be like on a pilgrim, you can come and do the role play. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I'm there. <laughs> now, Don, um, from from your aspect, you were there, of course, to look at the environmental samples, and we yeah. did get an opportunity in the trench that surprised everyone. Yeah. Um, how was that process for you? Because you were looking at burnt deposits. I know you did some samples in general, and yeah. I know you mentioned you got um, a type of grain. I've never heard. Yeah. Of. We, we, the first samples we got were from um, the long trench, I guess we'll call it Robin's trench, as that seems to make sense. So the trench that Robin was digging in that had the, the industrial remains, which was very poor. We did look at some deposits from there and it was really, really sparse remains. We did get some spelt chaff, um, which is um, more unusual in Roman Britain. You tend to get more spelt um, in the, the lower half of the country. Um, it was actually in um, later on in Chloe's Trench that we got um, far more dense grain deposits. So that there was probably about a few hundred grains of, of barley and barley grains would be far more typical on a, on a military site. Um, so it, it, it was a big variation between quite a short area near the girls, um, Girl Guides Hall. Um, and it was very interesting as well over in that, that deeper trench by the next to the house where we had the, the turf remains. Um, yeah, we had those fairly substantial um, chunks of, of, of wattles. So it was good. It was, I think it was quite, um, our trenches were quite small. Um, and because of the nature of the, of the, the later medieval buildup, it was quite difficult to get down to some of those Roman layers. But we did get um, some really good solid evidence of, of the Roman activities. So yeah, it was, it was very interesting. We just had a question come in that I think we'll address quickly now. We did touch, Chris already touched upon this before, but Jonathan Gladwin, I'm actually really happy for your question here because again, first of all, we're all archeologists. That's the most important thing is archeology. span um, So this is the question. Given the very short time available to carry out the dig, do you still follow the usual processes, section drawings, plans, GPS mapping, production of a final site report? Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, and um, as you can see, nodding from Chris and Hannah, um, so um, Solstice Heritage and Archaeology Biz, they're the main um, contributors for that, for the report side. Chris, if you want to jump in, you can. Sure. Um, and then Hannah as well. Yeah, so um, for, from our point of view, yes, my role um, is in intimately involved with that right from before we even land at Falkirk or any of the other episodes that you'll see soon. Um, we, just with any commercial um, or research excavation that takes, or evaluation that takes place, we um, liaise with local authority archaeologists or potentially where appropriate, either Historic Scotland or, um, sorry, Historic Environment Scotland or 
Historic England or whoever the most appropriate curatorial body may be to discuss um, what the work that we will do. We then provide um, written schemes of investigation for every episode of the Great British Digs, every evaluation that we've done as part of the Great British Dig has had WSIs, which we then discuss with the relevant curatorial archaeologists and agree. Um, when we land at site, we enact those WSIs. So all of the work is done with a specification in mind. We then also, following on from that, all, all of the work on site is done to the appropriate industry standards. So yes, absolutely, all the recording takes place that you might expect on any archaeological evaluation. And then after that, the reporting, which takes a while, so obviously isn't for Falkirk, which was filmed not all that long ago, isn't yet complete, but all of the, every single Great British Dig episode will have, either has already or will have um, a complete archeological report, which will become available. And that will include, it's segueing to things that Hannah will say in a moment, that will also include all the finds as well. Yeah, so similarly, we're working with all the kind of national guidelines, uh, whether uh, and looking at the regional research frameworks as well and fitting in all of that. Um, and literally every object that we find uh, is kept and recorded on the Great British Dig to the point that I have a 1990s Mars bar wrapper in my office <laughs> in a bag. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, nothing. Um, uh, is left uh, unassessed. Uh, so at the moment we're carrying out all the assessments for um, just over 7,000 objects that were found during the 10 episodes that we filmed over the summer. And um, once we finish those assessments, they'll go back to Solstice Heritage to Chris and Jim, uh, and they'll integrate those into the site stratigraphy just as any other archeological dig. And it's, it's just worth saying, obviously, that that all of that process, as, as Hannah rightly points out, we are working as hard as we possibly can to seek out every opportunity to contribute to re, um, uh, areas of interest with, from regional research frameworks and things like that. The Antonine Wall is a really good one because, and um, as an example, and uh, because this this evaluation really did, I think, contribute and hopefully came through in part of the programme, in my view, contribute quite interesting information to what we can, we as archaeologists or other archaeologists studying the Antonine Wall, you know, there are things in there that can be taken forward and, and, um, and areas which can be further investigated as well. So, hope, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that the work has contributed and that then that those contributions will then become available obviously in the report. Well, this is the thing. I mean, we're actually given a really unique opportunity here. As commercial archaeologists, we don't really get to choose where we dig. And this is kind of a nice little happy medium where we get to explore places that maybe we were like, hmm, what's going on here? But you never had the funds to. And then you're given the opportunity, like, here's some money. You're like, okay, <laughs> I'll make you a show. And then you're like, of course, you're hoping that like, I do hope there is archaeology here. I'm going on my gut, you know, my gut feeling. But that's where all the research comes in, all the pre-excavation. There's a lot. There's a really, really long process. And just hands off, like clapping to everyone involved with the pre to the excavation to the post ex post production, everything. I mean, looking at the first episode, wow, I don't know, I still don't know how that was cut down into such under an hour. I mean, I could talk about it for hours. I don't know how you can create a whole show and then explain everything. I mean, Marcus, they actually explained how you created your model. Like they gave you time. I feel like they explained it normally. Like could they just jump? But Marcus, I mean, whilst we're talking about your model, how was uh, creating it and all the steps that went to it? Because it's beautiful, as always. I mean, it's your work. Um, but how was the process for coming up with the model that you did? Oh, right. So, the, well, the process is basically feeding in from um, where we start with what we know or what we think we know. And then we obviously cut it back uh, based on stuff that's coming up in the trenches. Um, but also from... Um, because we because we had a suspicion that there was a there was a angular shift somewhere based on the topography on the on the landscape so it, it didn't quite sit right with the the stuff that i was looking at so there was an idea of that but obviously you can't prove that unless you have trenches so uh, and all the information tends to come in in the last day 
<laughs> so the model has to be flexible and it has to move uh, and change with the um, with the, with the archaeology that comes in. So basically, we start with something that we we th we think we know, and then we modify it when we get the information in. So it's sort of a uh, evolving process that happens uh, during the show, and uh, quite a bit of time pressure on there because it's you know as I say, stuff really does come in on the last day, and then you've got to show it in the afternoon or or the next morning. So um, it can be quite some late nights um, the day before the reveal. <laughs> It's true because it's such a unique opportunity as well for the public because it really is a community dig. I mean, we wouldn't be doing it otherwise. It's just being able to harness all our skills and really engaging with the public. And as you said, on there is an afternoon or a morning where we have to show everything we've done. And it's really unique for me because I'm seeing the models. I'm seeing someone be able to create something from a fragment that even I don't get to see in, in general, normal day-to-day -day working environments. You get specialists there to explain everything that's going on, explain why they know it's a certain animal. Like Hannah will go into details about how there was a goose and it was pregnant and you're just like, what? <laughs> you know, it's from this bone. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, it's just so amazing to be able to listen to and learn from everyone. And we have a lovely question come in from um, Elise. Thank you, Elise, um, who's five years old. And they've asked, how do you know when to stop digging? So Chloe, how do you know when to stop? Oh, when you reach the center of the earth is usually a good time. Um, so what we do at least is we, um, we dig and we look for changes in the soil. So if the soil looks different, then we stop and we make a note of what we've got and then we start again. And usually we finally stop when either we reach a layer that doesn't have anything to do with humans in it. So it's just natural, there's no human stuff in there at all or we go too deep and it's going to be dangerous to carry on. That's usually when we stop. <laughs> but it's a brilliant question. And we have another question, which is what is the most exciting thing you have found during the show? And this is from Toma, who's aged seven. And Hannah, I feel this question is for you. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, from all of these 10? Oh no, my. no, from Falkirk. Oh, from Falkirk. Oh, Falkirk, yeah. Um, well, hmm. there was a thing that was almost really, really, really exciting that I was going to talk about later that ended up not being so exciting, but was quite interesting. Um, Falkirk finds. I guess that the the tile, the tile of doom. <laughs> uh, <laughs> was, uh, um, pretty nice. Uh, it, it was in the show, uh, and you saw it. it was the woman that had the three finger grooves, and they did a close up of it. And uh, tile in the Roman period is is kind of tile, you know, it's made from clay. Um, it's kind of like flat, and you know, maybe a centimeter or two thick. And uh, and this is true. And some of these tiles are used on roofs and some of these tiles are used in uh, hypercost or so central heating systems. If these are broken and we've only got tiny fragments of them, it's really difficult to tell which is which. But it can be really important for understanding what the site looked like in the past and uh, what kind of structures were there and kind of the status of the site. Um, and we had a massive hoo-ha about these tiles um, because they looked very much like roof tiles. Um, you know, there was a general consensus. Uh, they had a flange. I don't even know what that means, but there was a flange um, uh, and, a, and a right angle. Um, but after quite a lot of research uh, and looking around, it turned out that these were actually a very rare type of box flue tile called a half box flue. And these have never been found in situ, so like in the place that they're being used in Britain. So the only way that we understand that these were used is from examples on the continent. So it's quite rare to find those there, uh, but that was information that we got through the post excavation uh, which has happened after they'd already finalised the episode. So that part didn't make it in. Wow. I mean, that's really cool. I wasn't it, expecting that. 
Jeez, I mean, I, from, from the show, I'm, I'm never expecting anything, it seems. <laughs> they always come and now I in. hate tiles. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely a lot of uh, CBM, isn't there, in, uh, in, in the show? I think it's a CBM heavy uh, series There's in general. There's a lot of ceramic building materials, yeah. yeah. And, and how, many, uh, how many bricks did you have kicking about in your house at one point, Hannah? Was it-, uh, it was like 743 bricks and brick fragments. Um, but they're now yeah. with Jim Brightman. <laughs> oh, well, he loves Rick, his so enjoyment. <laughs> they're currently overloading our office floor. <laughs> Have they named them all yet, Chris? <laughs> it's little Peter. <laughs> Just a bit short of time, unfortunately, but I'll get there. <laughs> Wow. And anyone else actually have like a favourite find from Falkirk? As the question was said, anyone felt anything? I like to be, um, we found, um, we found an inkwell, a beautiful, um, not inkwell, ink bottle, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, which we thought was probably to do with a charity school. So Robin turns up always with an old, the old um, ordnance survey maps and it showed a charity school in the area. And my favourite thing about the ink bottle, I'm going to embarrass Chris now, is that Chris recognised it instantly because he used to work for Beamish, which has a kind of a Victorian school, didn't you? I did. And, and, and so you went, oh, that's the teacher's ink bottle. And I loved that. And it was a brilliant find because you could imagine these kids, um, you know, just maybe the same age as the, the children who are asking these brilliant questions to us now, um, going to this school, you know, the, the parents might not have had much money, but they would have gone to that school in the hope that they could get a good education and then maybe get a decent job so it was really it was a really cool little find I love that one yep. mm. I was, was that also... Victorian teacher <laughs> <laughs> there was also the little slate pencil uh, that was related to the Victorian school yes. so that was that was really cool I should have said that instead of tile <laughs> <laughs> go with your heart Hannah <laughs> if your heart says box sleeve style I have regrets <laughs> No, I think it's really cool, actually, the box we tile. Yeah. Definitely faves. Yeah. Um, by the way, Michaela is on the live stream. Hey, Michaela. Hi, Michaela. Um, and she's asked, any clay pipes? <laughs> no? I'm sure there were. I'm sure there, there must were have been. Of clay yeah. pipes. I don't think there's been a Great British dig site where we haven't found clay pipes. Yeah. And it's a bit of a joke as well, because in, what episode is it? There's an episode, where I think, is it Oldham? Well, we have a lot of clay pipes from some yeah. trenches. That's why. So that's a little joke for future episode. Sometime <laughs> in the new year, you'll know when you see it. <laughs> We're Actually, a new discussion. We, now I think about it, we do have clay pipes and there's some really nice stamped stems. Um, I, there's an Edinburgh-based company and then there's one that's stamped Glasgow as well. So yeah. lots of nice Scottish tobacco, clear tobacco pipes. It's mm, very, very cool. Yeah. Uh, we, we, did another... find some, uh, we did find some lovely, um, br- there was quite a lot of brewing generally in Falkirk, I think, as well. And we did find some nice bottle stoppers, Falkirk mm-hmm. bottle stoppers as well, which was, which was really lovely. Mm-hmm. Mm, sounds nice. Uh, we do have a question from Aveen, who's age nine. Uh, why do you think it's important to involve the people who live on the places in the dig? Hmm. Louisa. I think um, it's generally people who live there are really, really interested in what's come before. And there's no, especially if you involve young people, I think there's no end to their fascination, um, you know, with all aspects of history. So I think, there's, you know, I think we've probably all got into archaeology for the same reasons, I'm quite sure. And that's because we were fascinated with history. But if you think there's a, you know, you kind of start to, I think, have a personal connection with that. If you're living in an area, you're living on top of where someone lived 2,000 years ago and you can actually track that back. You can see the objects that they were using. I think especially if you can hold it in your hand, you know, like that episode, you know, the end of the episode when people coming in, they were handling things. So even though it wasn't their garden that was being dug up, they can come in and they can actually tell the stories. They can retell the stories of what was going on in the past they can hold the thing in their hand they know that that was made 2000 years ago and and they understand what the thing was being made for and then they can start to understand the, the whole context of um 
who was there and what was going on at the time because it's all about people isn't it so you're making that connection with people in the past and that's so important to people as I say especially I think young people because uh, you know they've really got a passion for that and if we can kind of stoke that but that will hopefully stay with them forever um, and they'll they'll watch more episodes of the, <laughs> the Great Mission Dig. Yeah I mean I think one of the first digs I ever did was in my garden when I was like five so mm. I think it's important to get the locals involved <laughs> <laughs> and especially when possible get the homeowners to see turf so just <laughs> You know, though, it's, I, I always say this thing to them, um, to everybody, well, to everyone I get a chance to, because, um, you know, at the end of each episode, we we invite everybody in the local community into the tent, into Dig HQ, and we show them the finds. Um, and while I'm chatting to people, you know, I, I say to them, this is yours, you know, we're the guests here. Because if, if you live in that area, that's your community, that's your heritage. Um, it's, it, you know, it belongs to the to the local community. So we're the get we're privileged to be allowed to dig there and look at the the history that, you know, the, these whatever community it is that they they live on top of. Um, and I just think it's a massive privilege to be able to reveal that to people. Um, I was really happy that we were in Scotland as well, because I really wanted us to, to dig in and hopefully we'll be able to dig in Wales at some point. Um, because I should say about half of the crew, you don't see this on screen, but about half of the production crew are Scottish. And half of them are based in Scotland, you know, you don't see that. So it's, it, it was nice to at least be able to, to show that as well. Yeah. I think f from the point of view of, of, um, of the team who, from the archaeology team actually doing this, a lot of the digging, for us as well, it makes for great fun, just absolutely great fun and um, an opportunity to kind of work alongside pe people from the local area and stuff who really, really interested super keen to know what's what's going on and be involved so for from our side quite apart from in a, in a bit of a selfish way it makes for a really great fun week for our guys as well so that's a nice part of it as well that's a really important part for us actually is it makes the whole thing fun to be honest and not least of course at Falkirk seeing what um what t-shirt Stuart was going to wear yeah <laughs> <laughs> Fun question. How many t-shirts did he wear that was in the edit? I counted I it. So how many do you think? There was John Lennon, mm -hmm. the Lacoste Crocodiles. Yeah. Scotland football bad. Scotland football, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's one more. I can't remember what the... His face. Was his face on one of them? Oh, I missed yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Was um, there frogs or something? That was the, the cost. Oh, yeah. yeah. The cost, yeah. And there's a, a painting. I forgot. There's a famous painting by... Oh, the Scream. Yeah, the Scream. Scream. Yeah. By Munch, yeah. Six. So he yeah. on, on the edit, he's wearing six. But I know for a fact he wore more. Yeah. <laughs> Two or three a day, he would change just for fun. So... I think it just definitely adds to the element of the community spirit and just what keeps you going is, is yes, the archaeology, but it's also meeting the local people and the characters. And it's just, oh, the dogs are so cute. Stuart was Dolly, really good. Yeah. yeah. I can't remember the name of the dog. It was Dolly and... It was Dolly when I, mean, I was the, watching. The dog used to go in the... Um, he used to cycle around town with the dog in the basket. Yeah. And the dog, if, if he tried to leave without the dog, the dog would run after him and he'd have to put the dog in the basket. It was so good. <laughs> Toto, isn't it? It's lovely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and your little dog. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's loads of scenes obviously that didn't make it, but um, yeah, there's so many lovely scenes that we did get to to shoot. And yeah. Um, another thing as well, the, the dig HQ tent, that's there the whole time. So the public can actually go and speak to anyone that's inside the tent. Yeah. Um cameras or no cameras, with like there is always at least two people there. Um so yeah, that's just yeah. another thing to note as well. Um, and we had a lovely question. Um, by the way, for viewers at home, this is live Q and A. Uh, this is a live Q and A, um, but we are going to be slowly wrapping up now, as we're coming up to the forty-five minute mark. So please quickly get your questions in um, before we start wrapping up. Um, Elaine loved the question, so this is in reference to the Jetton or the token. Um, just saying, it was very interesting. Did we find out any more information after the dig about it? Uh, sadly, not. Like there is absolutely no detail left on that surface it is so so 
thin a piece of copper alloy. Um, we are going to run a couple of extra plates on metal objects, um, which is like a routine thing during post excavation, and it will be included in that. And there's a very, very, very small chance that that might show something up um, under the corrosion. But I don't hold high hopes. It's so thin. Yeah. But amazing. What amazing. Yeah. Find. Yeah. yeah. It was an amazing find. But that and the tiniest, tiniest fragment of yeah. Samian ever. I, I've never seen one so small. <laughs> <laughs> so small. That's a brilliant find though. Um hmm, Don, looking very quiet. Any remarks? That's just my face. Um, <laughs> I, I, so I I was just wondering, are the reports, will they be available to the public or are they going up on the archaeology data service or what does anyone know what happens to them? Yes, so um, they will be available. All of them will end up at the relevant local historic environment record, wherever that site is that, yeah. we've, that we've excavated. Um, and we're also looking at different ways of making them available elsewhere as well. Oh, perfect. So that may be through our website, it may be through uh, a, another website. So I think if people are really interested in that, um, keep an eye out for different for uh, different websites that where we might make those available. But if someone is super interested in any of the sites that they see through the Great British League, Falkirk or any of the other ones, they will, as a very le at the very least, be available through the local historic environment record local to that site. Great. It does take a bit of time anyway to be available on ADS. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll put the link in the description as well for anybody who's interested. Just in general, looking at your local sites, quite fun. I mean, if you're in London as well, they have something called layersoflondon.com, I think it is. Um, and you can see what's going on in your borough. So I'll put them in. Uh, for the description. Um, is there any closing remarks before we start to wrap up today's live stream? Mm -hmm. From Falkirk, Falkirk based only. I mean, we've got another nine live streams to go, so <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> it's Falkirk, anything else? Uh, Do you want me to tell, go on. Oh, no, go, go for it. I was going to talk about the blue. Oh, the blue. You want to talk about the blue? Uh, so while we were doing the post -ex, um, we a, a very uh, small chunk of, I can only describe it as blue, came out of <laughs> one of the bags. And um, we kind of like, oh, and our jaws dropped because we'd seen this very, like, looked exactly the same before in a Roman context. And in the other case, it had been identified as Egyptian blue, which is a Roman pigment, super rare to find it in its like um, solid state in, in Britain. Um, and we were like, ah, ah, like literally running around the office. I'm so, so, so excited. Um, and But the only way we confirm that, can confirm this is sending it off for analysis. So a sample went off to a lab. Uh, ended up being studied by um, the team at Durham University. So thanks to Dr. Kamal Bradnashani, uh, who really turned it around really quickly for us. And uh, he did his analysis and it was not Egyptian blue. Uh, so it was not a Roman pigment, very sad, but it was uh, Prussian blue, which is another blue uh, pigment, but this one uh, didn't start being made until the 17th century, so we're looking at something later. And given that date and what we know about the school that was around there, then we're probably looking at something that's um, come along with the, the ink bottle and, and the slate pen and associated with the school. So that was a really nice little story. Uh, I still think it's quite nice, even though it wasn't Egyptian blue. <laughs> And I was very red faced and like, oh, sorry. Um, but to, to get more of that story about the Victorian school was really nice. What an uh, amazing find. I think for, from our point of view, being able to excavate that trench through the turf rampart of the, of yeah. the fort was an incredible um, opportunity, a, a real privilege to see that archeology span um, and, to be amazed really at how well preserved it was so close to a house um that had nearly been cut through and built over yeah. for example um also preserving environmental evidence which you know we were able to get don to look at to tell us a lot but which really sort of put some of the deposits in there into context obviously brought together evidence that with the, the archaeology in that trench 
with Marcus's analysis of the um, of the landscape. So to to see that archaeology and to excavate it was a real privilege. But at the same time, it was great. Something you touched on, Tash, that we just don't get on a lot of normal excavations is to have people like Don, like Hannah. Um, and Marcus all there all at the same time that means we can kind of go and look at stuff in real time almost is 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 great you know and to get that um to get all those specialisms on site all at the same time is a real privilege really and in this instance it made a big difference to how we were able to understand the site while on the site you know so that that, that was brilliant amazing trench I still can't believe it Amazing. Um, we do have one last question in, um, and we've already touched upon this, but it's for Thomas. So Thomas, who's age seven, so we have to answer it. Um, Hannah, where do all the finds go? Well, when we've finished with them, they go back to Chris and Jim. <laughs> um, except for there are two, actually, um, from one of the excavations in West Derby, and I can't remember which episode it is. And there was a little boy and he came along every single day to look at these two finds and he thought they were amazing. And they're very modern and they don't contribute to our understanding of uh, the historic or prehistoric use of the site. And so those two uh, will go to, to him and all the rest will go back to Chris who will tell you now what they plan to do with them. Thanks, Hannah. So <laughs> we, um, we, so as Hannah says, the finds are part of the archaeology. So we squeeze every bit of information we can out of those objects. We get the real specialists in those individual those individual finds, whatever they might be. Um, for example, Chloe, the wonderful Chloe Duckworth, looks at and can look at our Roman glass. For example. Um, other people, um, Hannah and animal bones and so Louisa and historic pigments, for example, the, all of those finds get looked at. We squeeze all of the information we can out of them, which goes back into, we feed all of that information back into our understanding of the site. And that helps us enrich the picture, really, of, of the archaeology of that site, get the most information we possibly can out of them for having done the work. And then some of those finds end up going into museum collections that, again, in going into the future, enable specialists to look at them again in wider studies and perhaps compare them with other sites. So the, the idea of the archaeology is that ideally it keeps on, keeps on giving. Having done that work, it keeps on giving and, and helping our understanding of the past of, of that area. I think it's worth saying as well for um, for any kids that are watching this, and there seem to be some, which is great. Um, you know, when you go to a museum, the stuff that you see in the display is only a little bit of what the museum has. And they've all got these vast storerooms full of other things because they can't display everything. So then if you're a specialist, if you grew up and you decide that you want to know everything there is to know about blue pigments, then you can go around the museums and they can get out all those pigments for you and you can analyze them and learn more about them so we it never stops giving us new information does it it's amazing so next time you go to a museum if you go to one and look at all the stuff that you can see and then think about all the stuff that isn't on display that the museum also has because there's loads of it and some of that stuff has been dug up by an archaeologist in a hall maybe on the great british day yeah <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for joining in for this live stream. And to our viewers at home, we will be back next Thursday, 6 p.m., same time, to discuss episode two, live q and I actually cannot remember what the next week's one is. I think it's Dresden. <laughs> Dresden, we're in a school playing field. It's super. Oh, yes. Special, special episode next week. We're going to be going a few more thousand years back in time from this episode. So until then... Have a lovely, happy new year. Oh my goodness, happy new year. <laughs> happy new year, everyone. And we will see you all next week. Bye. Happy new year. Bye. 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 And we're offline. There we go.